to another Token Punch Lunch. We are back from Gen Con and we are digging in. We got more games that I think we've ever brought back from Gen Con. It was a great show. We had a good week, met a lot of folks, and had a little bit of fun gaming, so that's always good as well. We are back in full swing now. We've got some weeks of downtime, so to speak, so we can get back to normal a little bit before we are going to head off to Essen, I believe. So that is going to be a good time, I believe, as well. Essen is usually a good show. We get to meet a lot of people that we don't normally see because of course, it's across the pond. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get to our contest winner. And uh, that goes to Douglas Clipful. Uh, K-L-I-P-F-E-L. -E Douglas is the first name. So Douglas, congratulations. You have won a uh, Rebellion uh, insert. I have gone back to using the Zen Benz uh, version of uh, Star Wars Rebellion. So uh, that's what I'm going to be using from now on. But so this one is now yours, Douglas. So I need Douglas to send me his uh, contact information, his mailing address, so we can go ahead and get this on out to him. And congratulations, Douglas. We certainly appreciate you taking time to uh, watch token punch lunch and take part in our giveaway so without further ado i've got a lot of great segments lined up for you let's go ahead and get to them hi this is ambi from board game blitz and this is strategically thematic a segment where i talk about theme in different strategic games this time i'm talking about tulip bubble The tulip mania was a period during the Dutch Golden Age, where the prices of tulips reached an all-time high and then suddenly collapsed and were worth basically nothing in 1637. It was one of the first speculative stock market bubbles, and Tulip Bubble is a short stock market game that simulates this tulip craze. The mechanics in Tulip Bubble are pretty simple, but they follow the theme pretty well. The game lasts over a series of rounds. In each round, you can bid on different tulips to try to get them. But if you think that the price of the tulip isn't worth it, or you think that they're going to crash soon, then you don't have to bid on the tulips. Each round, at the end of the round, the prices of the tulips change. There are three different types of tulips, yellow, red, and white. And the majority type that's left over that has a huge demand, the price goes down. So if there's a lot of yellow tulips left over that weren't bought, then the price of the yellow tulips will go down and they won't be worth as much anymore next round. But there's also a deck of cards that has random events each round. So each round you flip over one of the cards and it tells you if one of the tulip prices goes up or down or something else happens and that can change the price of the tulips and whatever you thought would happen might not happen. So in the game, you're trying to get a lot of money by buying low and selling high, like in stocks. But it's all speculation because you don't really know if something's going up. You think it might go up because there's not much supply left, but there's also a random event, so it could go down and then you can get nothing for it. I think the most thematic part of the game is how the game ends. The deck of cards has one card that just crashes the market and the, the bubble collapses. And that is mixed in the last three cards. So you don't actually know when it will happen. When that card comes up, all of the tulips are worthless and no one can sell tulips anymore. So if you have a lot of tulips and you're able to sell them before the game ends, then you'll have a lot of money because they were worth a lot. But if you were saving them to sell and then the game ends before you can sell them, then you have nothing and you could be in debt. So I think that's really thematic because you're speculating on these tulip prices and then suddenly it crashes and they're worth nothing, which is just like the tulip craze. Tulip Bubble is a fun, quick, speculative stock market game where just one round can be the difference between being in last place in debt and being in first place with a bunch of money. Thanks for watching Strategically Thematic. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Cardboard Herald's Rook and Record, where we pick the perfect soundtracks for your favorite board games. And today we are taking a look at The Grizzled, which would explain why I'm so grizzly today. This game is an awesome cooperative experience in this tiny box, but it is not a tiny challenge to face. No, this is one of the toughest games that you'll play, not only in just plain difficulty, 
of accomplishing your mission of seeing the soldiers through the armistice, but also the tough concepts within. Yet there is also a huge amount of heart packed into this box because this game is not about conducting war. It's about supporting your friends and seeing them through all the challenges that they're going to have to face in order to have them all reach the armistice at the very end of the war and be able to go home to their families. This is a game with some high concepts, and there is a lot of tragic backstory, not only to the game and the subject matter itself, but also to the creators, rest in peace, artist Tinu. Because of that, I had to pick something reverent, something introspective, and something that recognized the level of importance that this game places on relationships. And so there is no better album whatsoever to listen to while playing The Grizzle than Plans by Death Cab for Cutie. This is an awesome indie rock album. It's an awesome album, and it's an awesome lyrical album. This thing has some of the most introspective lyrics about the nature of friendships and relationships and the dependency that we have on one another to see each other through even the toughest of times. There's a degree of optimism, of hope, that if we are there for one another, that we can persevere. And that combined with the overall punch and drive of this, the momentum, the, the music, the audio quality has this kind of marching beat to it as it sees you through the entirety of this emotional landscape. So if you're asking me, Jack from the Cardboard Herald, what is the perfect album to listen to while playing The Grizzled? There is without a doubt one answer that I would say, and that is Plans by Death Cab for Cutie. So let us know what you thought of our pick. What do you think of Plans? What do you think of The Grizzle? And what game do you want Rook and Recordified next? I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald, and you remember that the more that we do of these, the less bad music you will have to suffer at the table. Welcome back to another Accessorize segment here on Token Punch Lunch. It's been a while since we've done one of these, but that's okay. I've got a really cool thing to show you this uh, week, and it is basically a uh, upgrade, a deluxe upgrade kit for Rise of Tribes. So this is what we're looking at here today, and uh, it is... Uh, one of the things, one of the only things that uh, I had to talk badly about uh, during our Miami Dice of it that Tom and I did a, you know, a couple weeks ago. And uh, so this was really cool when I found out that this was going to be offered because this takes the game to the next level. Let's get down to the table and I'll show you what it is. So the Rise of Tribes Deluxe Upgrade allows you to take what you see here and turn it into this. And so instead of a whole bunch of just cardboard pieces, you have, uh, for example, the Sabertooth Tiger here. Uh, used to be just a round little cardboard disc. Now it is this uh, little meeple. The Mammoth used to be just a little thing here. Now it is this very sizable meeple. And uh, there's a volcano and a canoe for the event card that comes up for that. And uh, there are villages. Now these are wooden discs instead of uh, the uh, cardboard ones that came in the original set like so. So uh, then there are the invader tokens which looked like this before but now they are these little purple meeples uh, that can be placed on the board and of course these are not uh, necessarily small either. But I think the biggest uh, upgrade here, I think these are all cool but uh, the best upgrade here is the fact that these uh, cardboard chits 
have been changed into these resource pieces. So instead of uh, these, you have these um, tree meeples, I guess you could say. So I think that's pretty cool. And then of course you have the uh, rock or brick uh, chits that were just very hard uh, to pick up and to deal with. And now you have these that are very uh, chunky and um, easy to manipulate and so forth and so on. And then of course you have the, the, the circle uh, fish uh, that were just you know round discs of cardboard and now you have these little fish uh, meeples that are easier to pick up easier to manipulate and quite frankly aesthetically look better so as you can see it doesn't do anything mechanically speaking for the game of course it doesn't change how the game plays or anything like that it just makes the game more aesthetically pleasing as you're playing it on the board and it does provide a tactile reference, I guess you could say, because handling these wooden pieces is much different than handling just these little cardboard chits. And uh, it's just a little bit more pleasing, I guess you could say, uh, as you go about the course of the game. But on top of that, as I already said, it makes the game pop a little bit more on the table so people walking by will probably take a little bit more uh, notice of the game at, with these new pieces on the board. Now, I do have one small caveat that I noticed uh, while we were uh, using this deluxe upgrade kit. These villages that are wooden um, are very nice, and it's a, it's a very nice upgrade. It's just that it takes one aspect of the, of the original game out of the picture. The uh, village tiles in the original uh, set, the cardboard ones, had little numbers here on the bottom of them, and, th and that was a way for you to randomly determine who would go first. You know, these would all be face down with the numbers facing down and everybody chose a village. Whoever had the, the highest number would be the person who goes first. Now I know that's simply remedied by some other app on your phone or just simply saying, hey, Johnny, go first. Uh, that's fine, but um, it, it, it was a neat uh, way to choose who goes first and, and now it's missing, but that's really the only bad thing about this whole deluxe upgrade kit. Everything else is a knock out of the park. Now I wanted to show one more thing to you. Check this out. Once you have everything back in the expansion or the deluxe upgrade box, you can uh, close it up just like this, but then check this out. It fits right into the insert of the box where this little overlay thing used to go and you can carry the deluxe upgrade kit in the box. No worries at all. This just gets put on there along with the rule book and you are ready to go. So I thought that was a really cool addition to the deluxe upgrade box that it actually fit inside the insert. So that's about it for the deluxe upgrade kit for Rise of Tribes. I hope you enjoyed that. If you have Rise of Tribes and you enjoy it, the upgrade kit is pretty much a no-brainer as far as uh, adding to the value of your game. I think it's a great addition. So uh, of course, you have to make the final decision on whether or not you're going to want it to or be able to afford it. So that is it. Let's get back to the rest of your lunch. Hi, welcome to Board Game Opinions. My name's Steve Rang. I'm Jonathan Hicks. And I'm Mark Wood. And our flavour of the month this month is Codenames, the, the duet version, the two-player version of Codenames. So if you've played Codenames before, a lot of what I'm going to say uh, will make a lot of sense, but this is the two-player variant. Um, but basically, Codenames is a word game. You're usually playing two teams. In this case, you're playing with two people, so Jonathan and Mark might be teammates here. Um, and basically, it's a cooperative version of Codenames. You're going to get a double-sided clue card, which is going to relate to this 5x5 five five grid. And on the clue card, there are going to be some green cards that you need to pass that information to your partner so your partner can identify which cards are green on each side of the board. So Jonathan's trying to indicate to Mark which ones are green on Jonathan's side and Mark's trying to indicate to Jonathan the same thing. What you do on your turn is you're going to have in the, in the base variant, you're going to have nine clues to give, so Jonathan will have a clue and then Mark will have a clue and so on, and what you're trying to do is give a single word and a single number that is going to try and link some of the words in the middle together. So for example, Jonathan spotted water four. So he thinks there are four cards on here that are green on Jonathan's side that link to the word water. So you look at looking down the grid, you're going, oh brilliant, there's a chain, werewolf, earthquake, fuel, ski might be one, 
Russia, Pearl, ooh, Pacific, that's probably definitely one. So on Mark's turn, he would tap Pacific, and Jonathan would indicate whether Mark gets it right or not. Brilliant. Once Mark gets it right, he still thinks, well, there's three other water ones. Ooh, Boil, that could yeah, be one as well. On. Yeah, we'll go for Boil. Yeah, and we can keep going until either we decide to pass. If we pass, we take this clip, we put it in front of Jonathan to say, Jonathan has given a clue. And now we only have eight clues left. Or we keep going, maybe we go, Steam's Steam. got to be one. Yeah. yeah, we'll go for Steam. So in this particular case, according to the grid that Jonathan's got, Steam wasn't one. The other two he might be trying to mention might be uh, Glacier, maybe, and Ski, or Pearl, even. It's Pearl. Pearl. Uh, Pearl's in the sea. Uh, you said water, not sea, but get the, idea, the idea's there. And then Mark would pass a clue over. So Mark might say um, monster too, and he might be looking at werewolf and beards. He might not like beards or something. He might be trying to link other <laughs> words together. But on Mark's next guess, when Mark's guessing another clue, so Jonathan might give a different clue later, Mark's got in his head, there's still two clues relating to water that I have yet to get. Now, the thing that makes this game different um, or, or unique is that there are assassins on each side of the board there are three assassins and they don't correspond equally one of the assassins is green one of the assassins is a civilian uh, which is a blank one and one of the assassins is also an assassin on the other side so compared to regular code names this has got three assassins on each side so if Mark guesses one of the three assassins on Jonathan's side they instantly lose and vice versa what do we think guys? so I like code names anyway I think it's a very good game um, obviously it does require the whole t you need two teams thing um, so this is perfect if you've got two players but actually I prefer it to the base code names uh, it's I really like the cooperative nature of it and the fact that as you say you've got the assassins on both sides but they're not necessarily in the same position means your partner could be giving a clue for something and you're thinking oh but that's an assassin on my side <laughs> If I go for this, we could lose. Be like, oh, I really think it is this. So I love that whole second guessing. Is it this? Is it not? Uh, I think it's great. I think we agree that there is some downtime in code names, and this essentially yeah. eliminates it. I think agree. Uh, this is my preferred way to play it. While code names has been, I think, has been bettered by newer games. I don't actually think there's a better two-player of that similar sort of world game yeah, than this. I think yeah, this yeah. is as good as it's got, and I haven't seen anything better. Well, if you haven't played any version of Codenames, the English language is so rich mm. with like double meanings and extra communications. You can read the word, you can read the word minute, and someone else is reading the word minute, and things like that. You can see read, and they can see read, um, and that sort of thing. So, the, you know, just the, the scope in what you've got into in, in this sort of word game is great, and to do that in a two-player version is brilliant. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to do it, it's also my preferred game, and that is Codenames Duet. It's an excellent two-player game, and that is our flavour of the month. Thanks for watching. Hi there everyone, welcome to Jules Reviews. I'm Julie. Today I'm going to give you my review of Gonuts for Donuts. Gonuts for Donuts is a card drafting set collection game for two to six players ages eight and up. Gonuts for Donuts is all about getting different donuts in the bakery to score the most points at the end of the game, as well as denying donuts your opponents may want. The game can be played with two to six players. Here the game is set up for two players. Each player has a set of selection cards equal to the number of players plus one. Players will use these cards to bid on donut cards revealed under the donut row indicators, which is also equal to the number of players plus one. Next, the donut deck needs to be created based on the number of players. In a two to three player game, only the teal and pink donut cards are used. Purple cards are added to the deck in a four-player game and blue in a five to six-player game. The deck is then shuffled and one donut card is placed face up under each donut row indicator. At the start of each round, player secretly chooses a selection card that matches a donut row indicator to try and win a donut they want. Once all the players have picked their cards, they simultaneously reveal them. If two or more players pick the same row, no one gets the donut and it is removed to the discard pile. If you're lucky enough to win the donut you want, you take it from the donut row and place it face up in front of you to score for points at the end of the game. Donuts that are not selected remain and cards removed or won are placed from the draw deck before the next round. The game ends when the draw deck is depleted. The players then total up the points on their cards. For example, a player with three donut holes would score six points. The player with the highest total wins. If there happens to be a tie, both players claim the victory. 
since all the cards are are one face up on in front of each player, it is easy to steal or try to deny a card that your opponent may want. Rules are simple and easy to understand. Since the rule book as a good appendix to help figure out any special donut rules, it's rather easy to remember the rules the next time you play the game. The donut row indicators are thick cardboard and the cards are average. The donuts on the uh, cards have cute faces. They still look super yummy and make it tempting to grab a dozen when the game is finished. I find this to be rather easy to teach, learn, and play. The game is best with three or more players. Gonas for Donuts is a fun, simple, easy-going game that I would recommend. You might want to eat before you play, otherwise you'll be making a trip to your local bakery or Dunkin' Donuts once the game is finished. Thank you for watching Joel's Reviews. I'm Julie. Have an awesome day. Bye! Hi everyone and welcome to a Fellowship of Meeples. Hi, I'm Doug Jr. from Doug and Doug Gaming, and you're watching the show where we talk about the gaming group and most importantly, the people that make up those gaming groups. Well, during our last game night, we had a great turnout of gamers. We played some wonderful games like Oracles of Delphi, Seven Wonders, The Grizzled, Hit Zero. So we just had a great time and we had a brand new person come. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, he showed up and none of us had invited him. He just kind of walked in. And so I was kind of curious as to who this new guy is. His name is Colton, but I wanted to know just a little bit more about him. So I asked if he wouldn't mind answering a few questions for the show. He said, sure. So first of all, of course, I was like, hey, Colton, where'd you come from? Uh, I'm from Midwest City, Oklahoma. So if you know anything, it's uh, Tinker Air Force Base. Uh, that's the city directly outside of uh, Tick Air Force Base, and Midwest City is in central Oklahoma. I uh, grew up and was raised most of my life in Midwest City, but uh, I moved to the country for a little bit. I lived out on the farm in uh, Miami, Oklahoma, which is uh, northeastern Oklahoma. So, uh, relatively speaking, I was 30 miles from Joplin, Missouri. Well, that's a long way from here, so how in the world did he end up in West Florida? Uh, I've got a distant family here. Um, Oklahoma didn't provide me with anything. I, uh, I couldn't grow. I couldn't be the person I wanted to be. I had to always do this or always do that. You know, I felt like Florida would be more fluid, so that's why I came here. Well, next I asked Colton about his gaming history. How did he get started? What was the first games that he played? And this is what he said. Um, I grew up in as SCA, which is Society of Creative Acronism, and I have been a member since birth. Um, I got into medieval role playing, and I also got into uh, board games as well. I started out with uh, Nine Man's Morris. I started out with uh, Chess and Checkers as well. And it grew from there, the love for uh, just board games in general. And you know, gaming is different things to different people, so I wanted to know what gaming was for Colton. It's a way to turn my brain off uh, from the everyday stress for me. It's a way to um, transform the, the stress, the energy, the everyday life into something playful, meaningful, and everything else. It's it's a it's a very good way to not only transform energy but to allow it uh, to come out in its full blossom as well. <laughs> and since none of us had personally invited Colton, we're like, cool that you're here. But how'd you hear about our group? It was just random. I was just uh, scrolling through Facebook or whatever, and I uh, was thinking about the Game Masters Guild up here, and I'm like, all right, I'll give them a try. So. Next, of course, I had to ask the question, Star Trek or Star Wars? Uh, you know, I like Star Trek, but I also like Star Wars. <laughs> I like them both, but both of them have their own weaknesses, definitely. I guess I'm still on the lookout for that one diehard Star Trek fan like myself. I know they're out there somewhere. 
But for now, that's okay. We've loved having Colton be a part of our group, and I really appreciate him letting us ask a few questions and putting them on the show like this. But you know, it's really interesting how gaming brings people together. I mean, it's a big world, but gaming can bring people together from all over the world, certainly from all over the country. And here's a guy that none of us personally invited, but he found out about the group, he showed up. And so the next thing you know, we have a new friend, a new person in our group, and we're socializing, we're having fun. And you know, except for gaming, we might have never met Colton. So I'm so glad that this hobby lends itself to meeting new people and making new friends. I hope that you're meeting new people and making new friends, not just sticking with the ones that you played with, they're great to have around, but it's so nice to expand out and get new people in. That's really what this hobby is all about. So thanks so much for watching this episode of A Fellowship of Meeples. We'll see you next time right here on Token Punch Lunch. Hey folks, welcome back to another segment of Just Missed It. This is a segment where I take uh, basically usually just one aspect of a game, or maybe it's the entire game as a whole, uh, that just kind of missed my mark of being something truly awesome and truly great. Well, today we're going to be taking a look at just one aspect of this game right here, Sukuyumi Full Moon Now. Now, this is a game that I was introduced to last year at Essen, and I was taken aback by their display. They had a huge, sprawling board uh, laid out with a 3D moon that has crashed into the Earth uh, and has brought with it some um, Oni from uh, some faraway place. And, and the different players are taking on the roles of different factions. Some of them are uh, anthropomorphic, I guess you could say, animals that are going to be uh, striving for control over the world, over the earth. Uh, but the Oni have come down and they're fighting against the Oni as well. Uh, and it is a large, sprawling game, but it is so fun. I'm going to be doing a review of this here pretty soon in the next week or so. So keep an eye out for that one. But I wanted to take a look at just one small aspect of the game that just missed the mark. And if they could have done it slightly better, some way, shape, or form, it would have made such a big difference. Let's get down to the table. I'll show you. Now, as you can see, here are the components of the game. And the board is laid out. It's a modular board, which is really cool. And you have all of these cardboard standees, which I'm not usually a fan of, but it's okay, there's so many different of them. I can understand that uh, making this a miniatures game would have been quite uh, the feat. Uh, but uh, all of these different factions are fighting over this, so that's pretty cool. Now, the reason I'm showing this to you on this one is because of those cardboard standees. Now, as you can see, there's a lot that comes in the bag, uh, in each bag and everything like that, but it has these, um, plastic standees and these plastic standees are the culprit here uh, because if they would have been made just slightly larger to provide for thicker cardboard then we wouldn't be talking about this at all but as you can see i'm just going to take one of these out this is one of the boar lord uh faction and if you take this off look at that Oh, that's so, that hurts so badly. And look on the back. Now, this is one of the bad ones that uh, was really, Mark Street and I put these together and we did everything we could possibly do to make sure that these uh, pieces were not damaged in any way. We tried uh, splitting them apart like this, which actually broke off because these are pretty rigid. Uh, we tried uh, angling them in like this and, and pushing it, but nothing we tried, absolutely nothing we tried uh, could prevent us from messing up and damaging these cardboard standees in a very real way. So that's the reason that it just kind of missed a mark. I was willing to give it a free pass, so to speak, in uh, having cardboard standees because the cardboard standees are actually pretty cool. They have all of the stats of the 
uh, of the unit on it. They also have the name of the unit. They have a pictorial representation. The size of the cardboard standees are different. Like uh, this is a boar guard and, and, and then here's the boar mother. But then you have boarriers that are slightly different in size and shape. And so I like the fact that they did provide differentiation between all of the different units, but my God, goodness if they would have just had slightly thinner cardboard or just had these uh standee tokens uh be a little bit larger you know a little wider on the stand-up part and it would have made the game so much better i wouldn't have had to damage the game in order to uh get it to the to the table which is really why it, it, it really hurt Mark and I. Uh, it was such a painful experience putting all of these things on cardboard standees because we kept trying and trying and trying and we never were able to find a solution where we didn't damage that piece. But anyway, uh, I wanted to just talk about that briefly because I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. But anyway, a really cool game and uh, uh, it's a game that I enjoyed a lot. We'll talk about that more in the review that's coming shortly let's get back to the rest of your lunch see ya hi i'm almost a gamer and what i mean by that is i am married to a hardcore fanatical gamer and what i mean by gamer is a bored gamer i put together a list of the top 10 signs that you may be in a relationship with a hardcore gamer. So here we go. Number one, the only gift ideas they ever give you are for games. Let's see here. Oh. Number two, the majority of your more serious heartfelt fights tend to be about a game or a gaming experience. Well, if my turns are taking too long for you, then why don't you just play solo? That's what we all know you really want. Number three. There's always at least three board games in the back of the car. Aww. Number four. Your three-year-old knows Tom Vassell, Z Garcia, and Sam Healy by name. Tom Vassell. Number five. You on occasion find yourself as an advocate between your better half and all those non-gamers out there. I know, I know it's hard. It's just some people don't like to play games. Number six. Your loved one is always excited for the tax refund, so they can sponsor someone on Kickstarter. Number seven, you have to remind them from time to time that not all parties are game nights. Some parties are just parties. We are so sorry for your loss. He meant so much to all hey, John, of us. You could take uh, three more from Styria if you're interested. Uh, we're going to the week now, so... Number eight. Some classic games like Monopoly, Uno, and Clue have been banned from the house. And they would rather chew glass than play dominoes again. Number nine, and the most telling, they always want to play a game. And number ten, they always want to play a new game. If this sounds like someone you know, you may be in a relationship with a hardcore fanatical board gamer. And that means that you may be playing lots of games and know a lot about all sorts of things, gaming related. And that's all great, but instead of being a true hardcore gamer, you may feel kind of on the fence, like maybe you're almost a gamer? Well anyway, that's me. And I love playing games. I have my favorites, he has his favorites, but I would say I wouldn't know nearly as much as I do about 
the hobby of gaming or play games as much as I do if it wasn't for him. So it's what he enjoys and I love doing things with him so I enjoy it too. And if you feel like maybe you're not a hardcore gamer but you know more about gaming than the average, you play games more than the average person, then you're probably an almost gamer too. So thanks for watching and have a great day. Everybody, even Steven here. Most people last week were at Gen Con. Meanwhile, I was in Seven Springs, Pennsylvania for the World Board Gaming Championships. Let me show you a little bit about this convention in Pennsylvania. <laughs> We've also got the different tournament games which you can sign up for which are on these big nice plaques and then if you make it to the finals your name will be on here if you advance to the next round. Right now we're waiting to go outside the vendor hall. It's expanded from last year so we're going to see what kind of prize they have. A lot of people in line right now. So it looks like we have GMT games here. So we have Thunder Alley, Twilight Struggle, some 1846 series, all of the GMT games. Very good selection here. We've got Academy games here. So the 1754 Conquest series, all of their great historical games here to sell. We have a really good selection of board game pieces for different games. You got little characters, all sorts of little different meeples, pawns different things you could add to your games. We got some old classic, possibly out of print games for sale as well. We have nice wooden dice trays, dice bags, all sorts of dice that you can't imagine you could add any of these to your game. It'd be really neat, a really cool selection. And there's games here. Oh, okay. You got new Trail games okay. like Moa, you got Lowlands, you got Drop It, all sorts of different new hot games that are just released. I did want to highlight one game that I played in open area that we had a blast with, and this is called Drop It. So you have to drop a piece into this slot here, and it, there's just two simple rules. It can't touch the same shape or the same color, or any of the walls that have the shape on it. And you score points based on where it lands and if it touches any bonus circles. It seems very simple, but for non-gamers, this game was amazing. We played it, we taught it to kids, to adults, anyone who passed by was curious as to what this little contraption was. So don't sleep on this game. It's a cheap price point. Go out and get it. You'll have a lot of fun. I don't think you'll regret it. Okay, everyone, there's the World Board Gaming Championships. Now, it's a very good convention to see a different type of feel with that tournament play. It's kind of like a March Madness to see how far you can get and maybe even earn a plaque. And it's fun to see the different strategies that people try in the games that you love. Also, the open gaming area provides a good opportunity for you and your friends to try new hot games that are there in the library that you can check out. Also, Seven Springs the Ski Lodge provides a very nice resort to do different things like outdoor hiking, bowling, swimming, golfing, all sorts of different things that you can try out on the Ski Lodge Resort to take a break from gaming. So hopefully maybe next year you can check it out. I'll be there every year because I enjoy it a lot. We'll see you next time guys. Thanks for watching. Hey everyone out there, this is Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple. Hope you're having a tasty lunch and this is the starting tile, your source for gateway games, both new and old, to introduce your friends and family to the hobby. We're going to go back a little bit uh, old school, say a good five years or so, to look at a little two-player game that I think most people have heard of, Patchwork. Yes, Patchwork I'm looking at because it's only just recently entered my collection. I've been wanting to get it for a while, I've already played it and knew I liked it, but I wanted to see if my girlfriend would like it and she's taken to it quite well and I figured that, you know, I haven't heard much buzz about it lately particularly as this whole polyomino tetris style game has kind of taken off into other genres but I think you should still look at this if you're looking for something good and gateway level for two players. So in Patchwork you are building a quilt effectively, made out of patches. You have a board, which is a track where it just kind of acts like a timer for the game. You, your counter will move along this track based on tiles that you will pick up that are set out in a ring at the start of the game. 
You can only choose from the three tiles in front of you, and as you pick one up, some get you buttons, which is the currency for this game, to buy more tiles, but then they also have a time factor on them, which is how far you move along that timer track, and the further you move, the more goes that your opponent gets to get, because much like Takedo, if you're at the back, it's your turn. And so you don't want to be too far ahead of the opponent, but then you also don't want to grab not enough tiles either. It's this very sort of good back and forth trying to figure out what's the best tile I can take that will cover up as much of my board as possible, but not send me so far off into the future that my opponent gets to have all the tiles he wants and just maximize his time in the game. It's pretty straightforward, you just carry on until you all reach the center and then total up your points based on how many buttons that you have in total in your stash, less a negative point for each space on the board you failed to cover, much like all the other Tetris games. Most buttons, most victory points, the winner, as per usual. So how does this fare up with my easy scale that I've been getting used to? Well, E for ease of play. Dirt simple. There's like about two pages of rules you need to know. There's a, a bonus scoring for filling a seven by seven grid. But other than that, it just teaches you how to choose from the first three tiles, how to get button income, what the time factor means, and basically moving around that board. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Anybody could get into this. This is something that would easily see home in a game cafe. You could easily just pick up and play this. Not a problem. A for aesthetics. Not perfect, you know, this one is a little bit more stale compared to a few other games of this date or some, even this genre, but, you know, it's nice and colourful to see the quilt as it builds up on your board. The tiles themselves are all decent quality, you know, there's nothing like cheap feeling in here. But yeah, the colour system, as you can see, is a bit more faded, a bit more pastel style colours and, you know, it's not, it's not bland, it doesn't look dull, but I wouldn't call it like, you know, striking on the table. So, you know, we'll leave that to eye of the beholder. S for scalability. Well, <laughs> it's a two player game. It doesn't scale in any way, shape or form. So if you're trying to get something like this for a group, I suggest you check a look at my other Token Punch Lunch video or even my personal review on Baron Park. That one caters for three to four players and is a fantastic polyomino style tile laying game. But if you just need something for two, that's super fast that you could take with you on holiday or such, then this will do you fine, but it will only do you for two, I'm sorry to say. And then finally, why? The yawn factor. Is it going to get replayed over time? Yeah, up to a point. With this one, you don't have as much variety in the game as, say, others in this genre, because the tiles are the same, they're out in every game, they're just laid out in a different order. You still have a 7x7 seven seven grid, there's no special abilities or anything, or player powers, it's just how far you move along the track. So. I know that makes it sound a little bit like, you know, a little bit dull, but it's it's not. It really is all down to this cool back and forth between you and your opponent. It's a great duel type game. You know, you've got to you've got to think, you can't just play on autopilot and you'd be surprised how, you know, filling up most of your board can be more important than trying to gun for that 7x7 seven seven bonus, but then sometimes you might get that bonus and win the game because of it. So it's not one that I would suggest that you play like relentlessly all the time, but you know, I think you know, if you took this on holiday, you'd get a few plays out of it, put it away on the shelf, and then eventually come back to it and say, you know what, we fancy another game of this. The biggest problem that this has though is the, like, the table space. You need space for your boards and you need a lot of space for those tiles to be set out in a ring with the counter in between. So I warn you, if you've got small tables, this does hurt its portability issue a bit. So that's all I can really say on Patchwork. If you like what you see, please subscribe to my show, check out my videos, or just enjoy watching me on the starting tile on Token Punch Lunch. Hope you're enjoying your lunchtime, hope the food's tasty, and remember, it's only a game. Take care, guys. See you next time. Well, that's about it for another episode of Token Punch Lunch. I want to thank everybody for joining us. We certainly appreciate it. You guys are the reason why we do what we do, making these contents uh, for you to consume. So we certainly hope that you are enjoying it. I want to thank you once again, as I try to always do, thank my contributors for all of the hard work that they put into making their segments. They are really what makes Token Punch Lunch a great variety show. So we thank you so much, contributors. We certainly appreciate it, and thank you guys and gals out there for watching. We appreciate that as well. Well, we're going to go ahead and get on out of here. We'll see you guys again in a couple of weeks on the flip side. Take care.
Fatality.